maybe. Uh, topic here is called the Democratic Revolution from 1800 to 1844, uh, also popularly known as the Age of Jackson or the era of the common man, if you will. All right. So what we see in this time period is kind of a change in politics. And what you see is a decline of the notables, as they're known. And that's kind of these these, um, you know, family dynasties like uh, the Adams family, John Adams and his son, John Quincy Adams, who will become president. We'll see here in just a few minutes. Uh, but you see a rise of democracy in this time period in the early 1800s. Uh, we are gradually getting more and more people eligible to vote. Uh, more Americans, at least white males anyway, are particip to participating in politics. Um, property requirements and tax paying requirements are disappearing in most states. So essentially, if you're an adult white male, you're going to get to vote, which is far more uh, than anywhere else in the world. Uh, Western states are beginning to gain more prominence as they get more population. Uh, you also see really the rise in political parties. Uh, Martin Van Buren, uh, you need to know this man. He is responsible for introducing something known as a political machine. And how the political machines work is it's the good old boy system, if you will. Um, you know, whoever helps me get a job to win an elected post, I'm going to appoint them to uh, to jobs. This is called patronage or the spoil system. You have to know that. It's uh, make sure you highlight it in your notes. Um, you know, and sometimes people, you know, maybe your buddy from high school isn't the best person to have over the Department of Education because he dropped out in the eighth grade, you know, um, but you're going to hook him up and that's what the spoil system is. So there's some bad things that go with that, obviously. Now, a very important election in American history, 1824, is called the Corrupt Bargain, and it's also something you definitely need to know. Uh, there were four candidates for the election of 1824, and none of them are going to win an electoral majority. Uh, however, Andrew Jackson does have the most electoral votes and the most popular votes, but he doesn't have the number needed to have the majority, and so they don't really have, uh, you know, how to solve this in the Constitution. And so according to the 12th Amendment, uh, the House would then decide on who the top three candidates were. And Henry Clay, who finishes fourth, he's out of the running. He's out of it. Henry Clay, the great compromiser. He's going to throw his support behind John Quincy Adams. He despises Andrew Jackson and the feeling is mutual, of course. But uh, uh, John Quincy Adams is going to become president uh, and then he's going to immediately turn around and appoint Henry Clay as Secretary of State. And Secretary Secretary of State, even more than Van than the Vice President, is the stepping stone to the presidency. So, as you can imagine, um, Jacksonians, Jackson's followers, uh, cry a corrupt bargain has been made, and they're not wrong. I mean, there's been a deal uh, here in Congress for sure to get John Quincy Adams elected as president. Uh, at the expense of, to be fair, Andrew Jackson, who had more electoral and more popular vote. All right. So John Quincy Adams will become our last notable president. Like I said, he'll, you know, the last of those families of politicians uh, in an age when we were less democratic than what is appearing now in America. And really, he is going to have, he's just going to, like his father, he's going to be a one term president. Um, the Jacksonians destroy him. They work against him so hard that he really can't get a lot of stuff done. Now, he favors the American system, which you have to know, of course. There are three parts to the American system. One is internal improvements, uh, infrastructure. We want to you know, uh, facilitate the market revolution. So canals and railroads, national roads, things like that. Tariffs to protect Northeast manufacturing centers and the Bank of the United States. Uh, again, many Jacksonians are going to reject that system and they're going to work against uh, John Quincy Adams at every turn. And we get a battle over tariffs. Um, as you can imagine, the South is not a fan uh, of the tariffs. And we're going to get the Tariff of Abominations passed in 1828, right at the end of uh, John Quincy Adams' term, which raised tariff rates drastically. That's going to raise the, the prices on foreign goods, which is going to affect the South. Uh, this favors the manufacturers in the Northeast, as I said. 
Uh, so he's going to – John Quincy Adams is going to be up against Andrew Jackson again in the election of 1828. Uh, John C. Calhoun, uh, he runs as Jackson's vice president uh, from South Carolina. You'll, we'll be talking a little bit about John C. Calhoun. Uh, increased voter turnout in 1828 because a lot of people thought that Jackson got screwed. And this time, by gosh, uh, they're going to make sure that they they use their vote. Uh, and so Jackson is going to uh, – he's going to end up winning – the election by a very large margin. Okay. Well, all right. Jackson is a very fascinating individual. Um, you know, he, there was a lot of mudslinging in this campaign as he becomes president. His wife will die before he assumes the presidency. Uh, he blames it on the, his political enemies uh, for driving her into the grave, basically. Uh, but his agenda, rotation and decentralization. Uh, basically, he believes that when he comes in, he gets all of his people. He is a big-time uh, believer in patronage and the spoil system, Jackson is. Uh, he also doesn't really trust uh, his cabinet members, weirdly enough. He really relies more on an informal group called his kitchen cabinet. These are his you know, backroom buddies, he sits, he, you know, he takes advice from, he trusts them. Uh, and that's who Jackson is. You know, uh, so many people showed up to Jackson's inauguration that there was, uh, you know, they were crashing out windows of the White House and stuff. It was, uh, it was wild and people were getting hurt and stuff. Uh, and a lot of people thought that it started the Jackson presidency off on a, on a bad foot. All right, but we're still talking about that tariff and this new thing called nullification. Well, slave owners fear high tariffs, and they fear that because it favors the North, and they fear that slavery is going to be the next thing on the chopping block and that it's going to be outlawed. Um, John C. Calhoun, who is the sitting vice president, again, from South Carolina, he writes the South Carolina Exposition in protest there in 1828. He urged states to nullify the tariff of abominations, this tariff that's going to raise prices on foreign goods. He argued since the states created the federal government, they had the ability to nullify federal laws. And he goes back to draw on the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions of the early part of our republic. But, you know, and this is the thing with Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson is known as a states' rights guy, um, but he's sort of a walking hypocrisy. He is not going to take his power ever being questioned uh, by states or by anyone. Uh, so he is not going to be happy uh, with John C. Calhoun. You get the uh, Webster and Hayne debate. Uh, states' rights argued by Hayne versus national power argued by Webster. Um, Hayne advocates this nullification. Um, uh, but Webster says, liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. But, of course, it's not going to be inseparable because in 30 years, a little less, we're going to go to fight civil war. So what we get is a compromise tariff. Again, here's our guy. He's good at compromises, Henry Clay. Um, it reduced the tariff rates by 10% per year for eight years. Um, so as a way to mollify the South and keep them calm. Um, but they do introduce a force bill, which is kind of similar to what the British did back in the Road to Revolution days. Uh, which says the president could use military in the future to collect tariffs if, say, the South doesn't feel like paying them. So uh, you're already starting to see what some would argue um, is tyrannical tendencies from Andrew Jackson. And he's going to attack the bus. Andrew Jackson hates the bus. And so we're going to get something known as the bank war. Uh, the bank's president, the bus's president, is Nicholas Biddle, and he is a, that's him in the upper right corner. He is a cocky, arrogant man, um, and he makes the mistake of bragging on how important the bus was. Um, and, you know, he, he makes the mistake of also, during Jackson's tenure, trying to get the bank rechartered early. In uh, 1832, Jackson vetoes the recharter of the bus. Um, he's going to take money out of the Bank of the United States and deposit them in uh, different state banks, what become known as these pet banks. Uh, Biddle calls in loans on this, and an economic crisis ensues. You have a war between the president and the president of the 
bank in the United States. Um, it's not good. And, um, you know, it hurts the economy a little bit, but the, the bank, you know, is going to lose out to Andrew Jackson in this. Um, these state banks, these pet banks were pretty corrupt. Um, you know, so again, this is not good for our system at all. We don't have uh, Chief Justice Marshall anymore. We have a new Chief Justice, which is Roger B. Taney. Uh, he was appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court after John Marshall died. Okay. My internet is running slow. Uh, another thing always associated with Andrew Jackson and there are many things is his Indian removal policies. Jackson advocated removal of natives west of the Mississippi to what we know as Oklahoma today. Uh, even the five civilized tribes, which are located in the south in the states of Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida. Uh, and he passes the Indian Removal Act, which was to move southern tribes west of the Mississippi. But we have some, uh, we do have some people going up against this. In Worcester versus Georgia in 1832, the Supreme Court stated that natives could not be forced to move. Jackson ignores the decision. He even says, you know, Taney's made his decision. Now let's see him enforce it because the judicial branch doesn't have an army. And Andrew Jackson does. Um, this, the Indian Removal Act will begin uh, eight years later something known as the Trail of Tears, which happens in the winter of 1838. Uh, forced removal of thousands of natives. And, you know, the old and the, the young, uh, thousands of those died during this um, journey to Oklahoma. Um, you know, they were robbed of their money, basically. Um, just a bad deal. There's a reason the Trail of Tears. A sad state of affairs for the Indians. And basically, it, the Indian power in the East is done. Uh, Jackson has a tremendous impact. Uh, he drastically increases the power of the executive branch, which is funny because he, you know, he won on the state's rights, uh, that he's a common dude, that you know, he represents poor people, even though he was rich. There are no poor presidents. He might have been born poor, but he's a slave-owning president who's got a lot of money by the time he wins election. But he's going to drastically increase the power of the executive branch. Um, we also get a little bit here with the Taney Court. Uh, the Charles River Bridge versus Warren Bridge basically says that contracts could be breached if it benefited the community. Um, you know, basically uh, that the community itself being more important than you as an individual. Okay, I'm on. All right. So you get a political party that rises up in response to. Andrew Jackson, and they're called the Whigs. Uh, they believe, you know, they derisively call him King Andrew the First. Um, you know, they favor a strong central government still, but they promoted industry and internal improvements, especially in the West. It's kind of your American system. Uh, Anti-Masons become Whigs. Uh, Masons were seen as a very secretive group, and some people didn't trust them. And many of those people uh, went into the Whig Party. Um, Whigs become the first third party system in our country. We've kind of always had two up to this point. Um, in the election of 1836, uh, Andrew Jackson's two terms is over as president. And the guy who really started his show and really helped him win presidency, Martin Van Buren, is going to go up against several different Whigs. Um, what they're hoping for is a split in the electoral numbers so that this will go to the House of Representatives so that they can win that way. Uh, but that doesn't happen. Martin Van Buren wins. Uh, however, he's plagued by the Panic of 1837. So he's going to deal with a lot of Andrew Jackson's crap. Uh, it's really kind of going to kind of set his presidency back. Uh, why did the Panic of 1837 happen? Over speculation, uh, crop failures, and panics in Europe because we are um, – very connected to Europe with our trade. Uh, crop failures are always going to set set off uh, panics. Uh, what were the effects of the Panic of 1837? Uh, hundreds of banks failed, unemployment grew, and prices of land dropped. Um, again, it's not a depression, um, but a rough recession here. A very, uh, you know, 
harmful recession. All right, so Martin Van Buren's going to get one term, and then he's pretty much just tired of it all. And so we're, uh, you know, he's going to try to uh, beat this up and comer, uh, Tyler, John Tyler, in the election of 1840. Uh, Tippecanoe and Tyler, too, is the kind of slogan of John Tyler's camp, and he was a war hero of the War of 1812. Uh, you know, he has these, these sayings, log cabins and hard cider, and let's get the ball rolling. Um, and he's, you know, he's going to try to to get in there, uh, but he's running as a uh, as part of uh, he's vice president running for William Henry Harrison. William Henry Harrison is a Whig, so the Whigs think they finally have their guy. They finally have their president. But William Henry Harrison dies thirty days into his presidency, and we're going to get John Tyler, who's supposed to be a Whig. But when he becomes president, he's actually a Democrat. He just hated Andrew Jackson. Uh, so once in office, John Tyler is going to reject many Whig programs. He's basically going to be a president without a party. Uh, Democrats don't care for him, and Whigs don't care for him. So you can imagine how his presidency went. It's probably a reason why you probably haven't heard of him. Uh, ethnocultural politics. Uh, what you saw was voting along ethnic and or religious lines. Irish, Germans, and Catholics, you should know this tend to vote Democrat in this time period. All right. That's the, that's the short and skinny on it. We'll go into more detail, obviously, in class. Uh, there's a lot more to Andrew Jackson than certainly what we discussed here. Uh, corrupt bargain. Andrew Jackson gets cheated out by, uh, by uh, John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay. Uh, Jacksonian democracy means more uh, voting rights for white males. The tariff of abominations is hated by the South because it would raise prices on goods from uh, foreign countries. Uh, the nullification crisis is this. Are we going to allow states to nullify federal laws? We're not. That that would kind of lead to chaos. Uh, you get the bank war between Nicholas Biddle and uh, Andrew Jackson, but Andrew Jackson is going to win that basically, and that's going to not be good. Going to pull the money out of the bank, uh, out of the bus, and put it in pet banks. You get the formation of the Whigs against King Andrew the First, as they call him, and you get one of Andrew Jackson's last acts, and the one that he's most hated for uh, by modern people is his Indian Removal Act, which led to uh, the Trail of Tears. Uh, you also got a finally got a Whig president, William Henry Harrison, but he dies thirty days later, and you're stuck with his accidency. John Tyler. All right, guys, that's it. We'll see you in class.